Today is Thursday, August 26, 2004. I'm interviewing veteran Joseph Mendito at Central Connecticut State College in New Britain, Connecticut. Interviewer is Eileen Hurst Downey. Joseph, would you tell me your full name, your birth date, and your current address? Yeah. Uh, my name is Joseph J. Mendito. Uh, what war were you in and what branch of service? I was in the, uh, the Italian campaign. Uh, the, after the, uh, the war was over in, in Africa, the, uh, the, the war took place in the invasion of Italy. And I came in about, uh, uh, about a month or two after the invasion. Okay, so this is World War II? Right. And what branch of the service? Uh, Army, the United, United States Army. Army. What was your rank? I was PFC. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I, I was drafted. Where were you living at the time? I was living in New Britain. Oh, so you're, you're a New Britain guy from way back. Yeah. Uh, do you remember where you were, what you were doing when you were drafted? How old you were? Uh, I was, uh, when I was drafted, I was, uh, it was uh, 1942. I was uh, tw uh, t 21 years old at the time. And what were you doing? Uh, I was working for my father. And that, that was in New Britain? Right. We were, you were drafted by the Army. Did you think of choosing a different branch of service, or you were satisfied to go in the Army? Well, at that time, there was a lot of confusion, so uh, I didn't know too much about the military, so uh, if, if I was going to get into service, I, I think at that time, I, I figured one was as good as the other. Uh, yeah. Try to look over towards me yeah. and the camera. Do you recall your first days in service? When I was uh, at Fort uh, Devens, Massachusetts, Is we were... Is that where you did your basic training? No, uh, we, were, uh, we were sent to Fort Devens, Massachusetts to get our, our clothing and, and equipment to go to uh, our uh, permanent uh, uh, base in Oklahoma. So you went to Fort Devens, Mass, got your clothing and gear, and then you went to? Camp Gruber, Oklahoma. Camp, can you spell it, Gruber? Yeah, G-R-U-B-E-R. -E and is that where you did your basic training? Yes. Uh, can you remember uh, what basic training was like? It was, it was tough because uh, we were all frail, you know, and tender and everything, and naturally they're, they're trying to get you in shape to, to withstand the hardships of war, so it was kind of tough for, for all the recruits that I was part of. And uh, the first, first couple of months there, it, it, it was tough, especially when we were on these hikes and stuff like that, where you had to go 15, 20 miles at a time, and we weren't used to it. Our, our, our body wasn't uh, uh, used to it, and we were... Uh, falling out and stuff like that, and and uh, g getting it gradually toughened up. Do you remember any of your instructors from basic training? Uh, well, it's hard to say because I was there in, in basic training for about four months, and then uh, I was uh, transferred to headquarters company, and uh, I. Uh, I had a new group of uh, officers and and uh, enlist and commissioned uh, non commissioned officers in charge of of, of our training. Uh, where was the headquarters company? Still in Oklahoma. Yeah. Um, what but, kind? Of, if you were four months at basic training and that was to learn just the basics. Yeah. What did you learn at headquarters company? Well, then they sent me to. Uh, uh, headquarters company, I was in the Yes 2 section, which is the intelligence section for uh, uh, scouts and forward observers and learn how to operate uh, observation posts. 
uh, on the front lines with radios and, uh, and telephones uh, that were brought to us by the communication platoons. Did they give you a choice or is that where they told you you were going to be uh, trained? Did you choose to the intelligence company? In, in, in the Army, they don't give you no choice. <laughs> Why did you have any special background in intelligence that they thought that would be a good company for you? It wasn't a company, it was a, a, a platoon. And a part of this platoon, one section of the platoon was devoted to intelligence. The other part was uh, uh, records and, and things. Everybody had their own sp specific job. <laughs> How long uh, was the training at headquarters company? Uh, well, we, from there we went to maneuvers in Louisiana, and I then I became a, a permanent part of that headquarters company. I was temporarily uh, assigned when I first went there from G Company, which is a rifle company, and then after maneuvers I was permanently made part of headquarters company, which is part of the battalion. There's f there's three rifle companies in their battalion and a, a headquarters company, and I was in this headquarters company. After maneuvers in Louisiana, where did you go? We, from Louisiana, uh, we went to uh, Texas. We went to San Antonio, Texas uh, for a little bit more training there and to get equipped to, to go overseas. Okay, and uh, we've already mentioned that Joseph was in World War II. Where exactly did you go in, when you left Texas, you went overseas? Uh, we went from t Texas, we went to... Uh, uh, <laughs> Down, down in Virginia, Newport News, Virginia, uh, to get to get uh, on a on a ship destined destined to go somewhere, but we didn't, they didn't tell us where we were going. So when you shipped out, you didn't know what your destination no, was. No, no, it was 1943. Uh, I think it was October 1943 when we were shipped out of Newport News, Virginia, uh, Virginia and uh, that we were in a convoy of. 200 of 105 ships, 105 ships, and as you looked out of the ship, you see everywhere you everywhere you turned, there was a ship, and you were hoping <laughs> that you weren't going to get strafed because we were good targets. For and at at that time, 1943, when we went into the Atlantic Ocean, the uh, Germans were operating all the submarines in in the Atlantic there and they were blasting all our ships with supplies and our men in 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 on land in Italy and in North Africa and stuff like that were getting less supplies because they were getting torpedoed so uh, it, it, the trip from Newport News to North Africa we landed up in North Africa Oran North Africa it took us 21 days and the reason why it took us 21 days is because uh, there was being so many submarines in the area, German submarines in the area of the Atlantic Ocean, that we had a zigzag so that uh, they wouldn't set their target on us. Because I think it take nine minutes to uh, from from beginning to to actual pull the trigger, nine minutes to to, to strike a ship, and before that nine minutes is up. You change your course, so it took us 21 days to to go across the Atlantic, and in the middle of that 21 days, <laughs> I was on a Liberty ship, which is a private ship. They were these were leased ships by by the, the car maker after the war. I think it was what's his name now, uh, the big car maker. Uh, well, anyway, he he made a bunch of these Liberty ships, and he released them out to the government, and. And it, about the tenth day out, which is the middle of our journey, uh, we woke up because uh, the ship we were on, Liberty ships, they were private ships. They were merchant marines. They weren't regular mer uh, uh, sailors. They were merchant marines. They were paid. And uh, we woke up and we were we were stationary in in the ocean, in the middle of the ocean. Why? <laughs> and, Why? Uh, we were broke down. And there was one big cruiser making big sweeps around us. And I asked 
one of the merchant marines there. Now, what do we do now? Were you the only ship left all along? Yeah, the rest keep yeah, going? yeah, yeah. Sure, they can't stop. 104 ships going to stop for one. They can't stop. They got a mission to accomplish. They got, they have to keep going. They have they left this one uh, cruiser sweep, making big sweeps around us, and and I, I said to the to the uh, to the merchant marine there, talking to him. I said, "What do we do now?" He says, "Pray." <laughs> <laughs> and but it, but he says, "I said, how long does that ship going to stay with us?" Only as long as it takes him to catch up with the rest of the convoy. If it takes him 10 hours, that's all he gives you. They're not going to sacrifice 104 ships for one ship. So he said, <laughs> so it took us about four hours to, to repair this ship. Because every, every ship has a machine shop on it. If, if it's minor stuff, they could fix it. If it's major, it, you're out of luck. But God was with us, and they, they, it was it was fixed, <laughs> and we sailed. And we, we, when we went back, we didn't go back by that shifting of the seven minutes. But we went straight because he, we had this cruiser following us, see? and we, we, we caught up with the rest of the convoy. Well, that was pretty scary. Yeah, yeah. oh yeah, oh, we wow. weren't, we weren't, we weren't. There was about the, I'd say about two hundred of, of, of our men. In, in that ship too, because they have mostly cargo, bringing cargo to wherever points of destination, and but they had r racks, bunkers, with, sleeping on top of each other, four high, <laughs> in a crowded thing. And the thing about it is, because this here, there would be 200 men sleeping in here. <laughs> oh my heavens! I'm gonna shut this off. <laughs> When you uh, you caught back up with the other 104 ships, where did you uh, you went to Oran, North Africa? Right. And what did you do there? We stayed there about three months. It was mountain training, and because uh, North Africa is similar terrain as Italy, it's very mountainous, and uh, we were there uh, because uh, our forces, all the Allied forces, left. North Africa to, for the invasion of Italy. At that and, point in North Africa, did you know you were going to Italy? N n well, uh, we didn't know. You know, they don't. They don't tell you anything. So, uh, maybe sometimes if you don't know nothing, you're better off anyway. But uh, like I say, we we were there about four months, and uh, <laughs> I had the biggest scare of my life when I was in North Africa. What happened? <laughs> Every day, in order, in order to keep fit, you don't have the regular exercises. They make you go on hikes. Walking is the best exercise. So every day we go up and down the mountains and everything. See, so you start about eight o'clock in the morning, and then you come in about four o'clock. So, uh, <laughs> and every company is is one following each other in single file. So there's a 250 guys in the company, and there's, if there's four companies and there's a thousand men, single file. So you can imagine that would be from here to the center of Britain, or the line of, of soldiers walking in a, in a hike. See, so this, this particular day, my company headquarters company was last in the line of march, <laughs> and I had a stomach ache and I had to relieve myself. And as they were walking through a wooded area, I left think, to relieve myself. See, I went into the woods there to relieve myself. And I, that, I, that, when I was true, I came out and I'm looking for, for them, and I couldn't find them. I was in North Africa. And I was so scared. I, I, I climbed the trees, you know, looking for them, and they were through the trees and stuff. I couldn't see anything. So I went to the ground. Uh, I tried to see, hear, see if I could hear any any truck movement or voices. I, I couldn't hear it. I run here and there, and I, and I came back in a circle to, to where I started from. And I looked up here and looked there, and I went. I couldn't. I was running and running. I, I had a rifle with me, but no ammunition. When, when we were in North Africa, it was not a combat area, so no ammunition was was, was furnished. So we, we had a, just a rifle with a, with a bayonet and stuff like that with a pack on your back. 
And I had a, I, I couldn't turn back. I didn't know where to go back, so I was going forward. And I'm heading toward the little village there. And, and I, on the mountainside, there was was Arabs on these on these mountainside, look staring down at me. You know, and, they, and I was scared, like I thought maybe they're going to attack me because they said that they would they would jump a man, a soldier, just to take his T-shirt. And I was by myself, but I had a rifle. But they didn't know I had no ammunition. And it's there. So I'm heading towards this village. Oh, I was scared as hell. I had, and I couldn't turn back because they were looking down at me. And I had to go forward. You understand? I'm going forward. And, and there was two horses stride each other. And there was a little thing across them. I think it was like a funeral procession. <laughs> and I had to go to that, see? And I made, I just, I, I went, I held my poise and, and I walked through, you know, it didn't appear to be scared or nothing, understand? I walked through and I went through there. And I landed on the other side of the, the village there. And I'm, I'm listening to the ground and looking for dust because there's no roads over there. The roads they had was all dirt roads. And we had a lot of trucks moving there, see? So they create a lot of dust, see? So I'm, I'm looking at, I'm looking at the, the, these, these trees, see if there's any dust accumulating up in the air there, see? I'm looking, looking, and all of a sudden I hear some rumbling. I hear some rumbling, and I running towards the, the direction of the rumble. I'm running, 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 and I run. I, I meet a road there, and his trucks going up and down the road, and I hollered at the whole 200 drivers. It was, it was a big, uh, regular size truck. And he was bringing water to to the to the camp. I, I hollered. I said, "Hi, hey, hey, help me." He said, what's wrong, soldier? I said, I'm lost. <laughs> he said, where are you going? I said, headquarters, company, 2nd Battalion. He said, you're lucky. He said, I'm going to go down there and bring you some water down there. He said, hop in. <laughs> Boy, you were lucky. Yeah. Then you got a ride there? Yeah, yeah. he brought me right I to that place. I think you were glad to Whoa. see your old company. <laughs> and they didn't, know, they didn't know I was missing. They never knew the whole time? I, could, I got back about 3 o'clock. Understand that, and they get up, they got back about four, so they didn't know I was missing. Nobody knew that I was missing. They could they, they could have killed me, and they never would have found me. God help uh, us! Yeah. Wow, you yeah. already had two scary things happen. You haven't <laughs> even been in combat yet. <laughs> uh, so you did more training in North Africa, and then um, where did you go? From there. We took a boat, an English boat, a big English boat that brought us from North Africa to, to, to Naples, Italy, a carrier. It, it was a stormy six days that we were on. It was in, in the, the, the time of the year when the, when the, uh, the, the storms were in, in the Mediterranean Sea. We had to go across the Mediterranean Sea into Italy. Now this was still 1943. Yeah, what well, 1944? The beginning of 1944. Okay. Uh, we we had a uh, like I say, they made the invasion while we were in in uh, Africa. They made the invasion of Anzio, and so we were there. Now in case they needed us, there was another division ready to help. So they didn't know whether to, to send us to, to Anzio because the, the Germans are now were pushing. The, the, the forces that invaded Anzio out to the sea, and they didn't know whether they, 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 they had to go back to the sea or what. So they, they, they counteracted the, the attack, and they, they were able to hold, uh, stabilize their positions, and they sent us to Monte Cassino. That's where I went to Monte Cassino. I, I, and can I, you tell me about Monte Cassino because um, we know that that's a very famous battle. Yeah, for World War so they II. sent me up, and it was all rainy the whole week. We were there about two weeks. Most of the time it was rainy, and we were climbing the mountains there. And it was mud and everything. We had more trouble there, and and, and there was constant. Uh, Monte Cassino was the biggest 
biggest battle that was going on at the time because there was no D-Day and nothing. This is prior to D-Day. This is prior to all the action that was in Europe. We were the only forces in action in Italy. They were in, in England preparing for the invasion of D-Day and stuff like that while we were doing the fight and holding back the Germans, their best forces in, in Italy. Understand? And uh, like I said, I was a, I was a, uh, 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 with the S2 section. I had they set me up uh, uh, online uh, up uh, up in the OP, which is in the ground, and uh, we tried to, uh, What's to OP mean? Uh, observation post. Uh, we, uh, we 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 the front, we had a radio with us and a telephone. They, the, our our communication would bring us a, a line, and we had our telephone. There, double, we would wind it up and it would ring the bell if we needed it, you know. And we had a, a, a radio with us. It was a heavy radio, not the radios like today. Everything was all massive then. And uh, we were up there and we were, we were so far up there, we, we were way up in front of our own troops. And, and they were afraid that we were going to get captured and they were by a roving German patrol. So our engineers came up one night and they, they, they put a, a, a stiff, taut uh, wire across in front of us, uh, maybe about uh, 30 yards, just in case any patrol tried to uh, contact us. I mean, in, in the, uh, the, our enemy uh, patrol trying to force their way into uh, to our no, uh, positions there. They would trip on this wire, and at the end of the wire, there would be uh, dynamite, blocks of dynamite. It would explode, and, and, and it, we wouldn't know what to get the hell out of there because it, it, it was somebody tripped the wire, see? So we now, were there. At that time, was Monte Cassino in German hands, or? It was German know, hands. So the Germans were there. Now, is Monte yeah. Cassino a mountain, a town, no. or monastery? No, it, it, it's a monastery. And it's a pie. It's a pie on this mountain that they built this monastery. That's why they call it Monte. Monte means it in Italian mountain, Mount Casino. See, and uh, they they warned the they warned the uh, Germans not to use the, the the monastery as a battleground. They said it's against the laws of Geneva, and. Uh, they, they they said that we're not using the things, so, but they, they they took surveillance planes every day, flew over, and they saw new activity all the time, the new enemy activity going on in this Monte Casino, so they warned them. We saw the activity change from day to day. Get out of there, or else we're going to bomb it. Oh no, we're not doing it. So they they bombed, uh, American forces bombed it, and after they bombed it, they showed new diggings. They were still using it because it was high up there, and it 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 had the the whole valley. Because it was high up there, they had the whole valley under surveillance. Understand? So that's the reason why they wanted it, and they wanted to hold it as long as they could. Understand? So they 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 uh, they, they made this. Uh, they made the uh, troops, uh, our troops, go up there maybe a couple of weeks at a time to, as a, bat a battle training ground, which good training, but a lot of our boys got killed because they were using actual live shells. And, they were, and this was the only uh, battleground in, in Europe at the time. So we were taking a beating. So, but, so but when we come back off the lines, we went to uh, TUFO after. TUFO, I went back, can you spell that? Yeah, T-U-F-O, TUFO. We were, they were the British uh, stream, Cold Stream Guards was, was, were uh, maintaining that line, which is the gust of line, and uh, we relieved them at, the t at TUFO. And we... Uh, uh, we uh, we were there uh, well uh, over a month. In fact, <laughs> the, we were in uh, in this, two, this town of little town of Tufo, and the buildings were all battle 
uh, ruined, you know, by uh, our machine guns and whatnot, and we were using them, uh, but we dared not show show us, show them that we were using them because they were on a higher ground ahead of us, and uh, and uh, they could see everything. So we we were very discreet, you know. Uh, and not the, not the, where it was under observation to be to be careful. Only use it at night and stuff like that. Uh, one of my friends was a, our jeep driver for the S2 section, Joe Dobick from the Britain, Connecticut. A nice guy. He uh, he uh, he used to do all our running around with the, the jeep, and he had to pick up the mail, and the mail. Uh, was uh, on the other side of this roadway, and, but the roadway was under was under observation during the daytime, not to use the road, because it was about a mile long, and the Germans had observation of that road, and they had it all zeroed in, so they, uh, Joe, one day, he had to pick the mail up, and he left a little early. So he's going to chance it to go on this road. So he he's driving on this ro ro road with him, and a fellow next to him, and two other fellows from the other companies that are going to pick the mail up for their companies. And they get almost to the end of the road. They get air burst, and Joe they, they went right through the. The motor, you know, the the hood of the cab, where your feet could run under, under there. One, one, one piece of strap would cut his leg right off. And a good thing they were next near the end of the road where it was an aid station. Or he could have died of blood, uh, in loss of blood, because they saved him. Yeah, they saved him. So he went. He he he, he one leg was was f at the moment lost. The other one was partially, but it was badly b banged up. So they brought him to, uh, to a hospital in Santa Maria, Caserta. And uh, we happened to come off the lines and for a rest. And I, I said to my, uh, my uh, sergeant, I said, I want to go down to the hospital to see Joe Dobick, because he's from New Britain. We we're close friends, see. So I go down to the, the hospital in, in Santa, Santa Maria, and uh, he had, Joe had his, he was on a bed there. It was a, uh, it was a regular hospital, but it was taken over by the, uh, the, the Americans, you know. And Joe had his feet way up in the air like that there, and they, they, cut, they cut the boat. And they they were stretching them, you know, to, to have the the the, the, uh, the skin heal over the ends. They were being stretched. So he was happy as hell. Th this was April 1944, and the war didn't end till May 1945. They had a year to go yet. So he's happy. Hey, Joe. I'm going home. I'm taking that white boat home. I said, no, oh, Joe, thank God you're all right. I said, when you get back home, go down and see my folks now. Said, oh, no, I'll go down and see them, Joe. I said, sure. Yes, I'll go down and see them. He was happy. He said, I'm taking that white boat home. You know, the white boat is the, is the Red Cross boat. The, the, you know, that there, you could have the, all the lights on you want at night and everything, and not one German would fire on it. They, 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 they recognize that, because if you start fooling around, we're going to do the same to you, understand? So they recognize that, understand? So he was happy with the good of getting home, see? And you know what? This was about April of 1944. And... In, in about September of 1944, my folks sent me a letter saying, Joe Dilbeck came down to see us. He, he, he was sent to, to Walter Reed Hospital in, in Washington, and it fitted with prosthetics. 
and they, 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 he was able to walk on his, on his own with the, the prosthetic. They, teach, they taught him how to, how to walk and everything. And he came down to see him. In fact, he stayed overnight because my, my father lived in a tree family house. And there was a party on the third floor, a, a young couple that lived there. And there was a hurricane that day. And he stayed upstairs because he knew them. He stayed up there until the hurricane was over. <laughs> I'm, we're, we're, we're losing a lot of time here, huh? That's all right. Huh? So did you see Do Joe Dobick when you got back home? <sighs> he, he was getting a good disability check. At that time, there was a lot of bars around. I came home, uh, and I said, I go uptown, uh, you know, I was in uniform and everything. Everybody was in uniform. And I said, hey, huh, you ever see Joe Tobik? Oh, yeah, anytime you want to see him, he's down the Arlington Arms. Always, always on the Arlington Arms. He's spending his check on the Arlington Arms. So, I, one day I go down into the Arlington Arms. It was a long walk from, from the door, in, entrance door to where the bar was. And Joe's sitting on a stool at the bar. He looks around and sees me. It was a different story now. I had my legs, he didn't. And he was sorry that I came back. He didn't even want to hardly talk to me because I had my legs, he didn't. And I hated to see that moment, but that's part of living, part of war. You see, it turns people around. You know, he was the guy that was suffering. He went through all that hell and everything, and, but, but he, he made it, but when he made it, there was other guys that were there with him, came back a little better than he did. Understand? Well, they went through more hell than he did, but they came back. I hated that. You know what? I, he lived about five minutes from where I lived. I used to walk sometime to his house. He lived in a two-family house. <laughs> And one day, it was hot as hell. I went to see him, and he, he came to me, and now his, 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 his mechanical feet weren't working. They weren't working. So guess what? He, I, I went to the back door, knocking on the door, and he came to me walking on his stumps. I walked, so he said, all right, Joe, come in. It was hot as hell. He sat down, I was telling him, how you doing, Joe? Uh, I'm just, just checking up on you. He goes over to the refrigerator, gets a bottle of Coke, goes to the cupboard, gets a glass, puts it on the, on the table, opens the bottle, pours the, 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 the Coke, and drinks it. He doesn't even offer me a drink. <laughs> oh, well, I guess you found out how he was doing. Yeah, but that's... <laughs> Where did you go from Tufo? Tufo, they, they set up a, a sand table. It has a big table. They had a sand table on each, on, the, on this sand table, they had all, all the terrain marked out in hills and valleys and houses and everything. So that when we made the attack, we were no, to know where we were. And then everybody- This was which attack? Attack on? Uh, on, on, on Santa Maria Infante, which is part of the, the major attack of, of, of Casino. We were all uh, on the same line. Santa Maria Infante? Infante, I-N-F-A-N-T-E. Infante. So these were these were towns. Yeah. We were going to attack on the way to getting Monte Cassino. Yeah. 
on the road to Rome. On the road to Rome. So did you attack those towns? We went. <laughs> that's what the book is. My, my, my part in the, in the book is uh, I was with the colonel. He was a battalion commander, Colonel Kendall, nice guy. And uh, he, uh, I had a, <laughs> I had an extra radio on my back in case our radio man needed, wore out the battery. I had another battery, live battery to, to, to use. And part of my equipment, I had to carry a, a tape that round, about 18 inches in diameter, through about three quarter inches wide, cloth tape, you know, regular cloth tape. And as, you know what the, you know what the use of that tape was? No. The lead man in the attack now was supposed to carry that, like I did, a bit, one like that. And as he progressed on the thing, let it out. So when he's walking, if, if he doesn't step on a mine, he's safe. So somebody could follow him. So leave the tape out. If he made it, the rest could make it. So he'd follow that tape, see? Yep. <laughs> and you were the lead man? No, I wasn't the lead man. I had an extra tape oh, in yeah. case that man ran out of tape. Yeah. I was supposed to tie into it so the rest of the guys could use it. So guess what happened? In the attack, <laughs> we had, the battle for Santa Maria Infante was from Interno, Italy. There, we, we it was on the Gulf of Gaeta, which is a, a seaport there. See, see, and our naval ships were firing big shells at this target. And you know, when they fire shells, they, they, they you know they miss. The shell there, the shell there. So when you're walking there now. And, and they make big craters when they bomb, boom, the dirt flies over and they make a big hole. You're walking in the dark and you, you stumble into them. I stumbled into them, I lost my helmet. I'm looking for my helmet. I can't find it. And the machine goes, do, 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 I want the helmet. Yeah, I won't need it. I left it there. I went. What I, I was uh, walking around with, without a helmet, with my rifle, and I had that, that that tape with me. Understand? And they were they were firing very pistols in the air. <laughs> they, and it made it. See how bright this is? Uh -huh. that, that was even brighter than up there. The, 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 the parachutes would come down with the with the with the with the flares slowly. And it lit up all the place. You couldn't move. They were firing that shadow. The Germans were firing that shadow. More, more than fire. Holy, how do you get out of here? How do you get out of here? And the colonel, he was supposed to have this town taken by 3 o'clock in the morning. It was, it was 3 o'clock, and we were just about started. And, the, and there was, in Italy, because it's mountainous, there was walls there, retaining walls. And the hole up the, the soil so people could use it for planting and stuff, see? And they were all huddled behind these walls. The, 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 the Germans were up on the hill there, firing down it. Like, yeah, the colonel comes up and he sees them all over there. Come on, get up there! Fire your pistols! There was a, there was a building there, and the, the, the machine gun was coming from that building there. He's fire! And he was firing his, his pistol. Doo, 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 doo. He ran out of minutes. He grabbed the man's rifle. Doo, 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 doo. He grabbed the bazooka. He was going crazy <laughs> because he couldn't keep up. He shouldn't be there. He was a colonel. Wow. <laughs> so he says, come on, come on, you fellas. Come on. So me and another fellow from the Britain, Frank Scorzato, his jeep driver was in back of him. He said, come on! So we, we go in back of him. <laughs> he gets hit in the head. The colonel? <laughs> I said, Frankie! Frankie comes over. I said, the colonel got hit. So we took his first aid kit off his, off his, off his thing there and tried to wrap it around his head. 
And there was blood was coming out, and the white stuff, the brains was coming out. I said, Look, Frankie, he's gone. He's gone. Let her alert everybody. Hold what we got for a counter. We've got to be afraid of a counterattack now. We had nobody to, to lead us here. So Frankie took all his identification now in case we had to leave his body. We couldn't, we, you know, we, we couldn't do nothing. We had to take identification off. He said, I'm taking all of the identification off. And I, I said, I'm going to use this helmet. So I took his helmet and I wiped the blood off and I used it for three days. I used this for three days. Did you have it? No, I had to use a new one, you know. But it was a hole like that. And, and you know, after three days, when, when our, we lost that battle and somebody else had to push us through us to, in order to, to, to get the Germans, they, they, they killed so many of our men there and it captured so many men that we lost the battle. And then they took off. They took off. And they, that's when we started to advance. See? And, <laughs> and the, the news correspondents in town looked in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the area where we were, he's looking for news stories. So he sees me with this hole in the head like that. And I had, uh, you know, when Scorzato took the, 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 uh, the silver leaf off the, the colonel's thing, a helmet, he, he left uh, the solder mark, looked like a lieutenant bar, see? So the, 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 Sid Fetter was the, was the reporter. He says, hey, uh, Lieutenant, he sees the thing, how did, you how did you survive that hole in your head? <laughs> What'd you say? I said, it wasn't my, my, it wasn't my uh, uh, helmet, it was the Colonel's helmet. Were you with the Colonel? I said, yeah, Frankie and I were from the same town in Britain, Connecticut, and he wrote a story about us, and he wrote a story about us. <laughs> <And> <laughs> <laughs> and where did you go from Santa Maria and Infante? We, uh, and we walked all the way from there. We walked to Angio. We had a cut off. We went up to the mountains. We, w we were two, 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 two weeks in the mountains. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, we walking because what our orders was to cut off the road that was feeding the, the Germans troops at, at Anzio, so we had to cut them out, see? So we, we were up in the mountains there, and, <laughs> and we were out of food, out of ammunition and stuff, and, and, did, and one day a plane comes over with, and drops boxes with parachutes, you know? And we were way on top of the mountains, <laughs> and, and the, the, and the and the pilot misses his mark on the mountain, and and the and the and the parachute lands down on the down the bottom of the hill, way down the bottom of the hill, and the guys are hungry, they're hungry, you understand? So they're running down the hill, they're running down the hill with a bayonet, and so they could open the because those days it was wooden boxes, see? They went and run down the hill, to, 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 <laughs> so they open up the wooden box down there because he want to get something to eat right away, see? He opens the box up. Guess what? Hand grenades. Oh. He was so mad, he was going to take the hand grenade and throw it back at the plane. <laughs> Did you finally get some food? Yeah. <laughs> they brought it by mules. Wow. <laughs> How long were you at Anzio? No, we, we just we walked there and came out of there because it, it, it was free. It, it, they had no problem there. The the war, yeah. Yeah. <sighs> wow. Um, where did you go from there? <laughs> we went on the road to Rome. We were the f one of the first uh, divisions in Rome. We walked and walked, and, and our, our planes would, uh, good days, they would strafe the Germans in front of us. And of course, those days, they, they, they didn't have too much gas, gasoline. So a lot of their heavy equipment and stuff was brought by Belgian horses. So when our planes came down, they killed the horses, and the horses were in the middle of the road. And as we came by, marching through the towns, the Italians were there cutting all the meat off the horses, the dead horses, understand, to eat. The flies all around. <laughs> and there was uh, these, uh, uh, like, big heavy jeeps with the, with the Germans 
uh, officers in there. And, and one Italian was taking the sh one shoe off, of, uh, the boot off one, and the other one, another guy was taking the, fighting for the boots off the dead, dead German, and he was laying there with bullet ridden, you know. <laughs> wow. uh, any other incidents happen on the way to Rome? Yeah, you know, they, they were so ha happy to see us that Italy, the, the Rome wasn't touched at all. It was an open city. Everybody agreed not to fire nothing. The Germans and the Americans, it was an open city. You could go to, you could go into the, one of the stores and, 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 and buy a pair of silk stockings for yourself. They had in, in, in Rome at that time. It was an open city, understand? Mm -hmm. And we met, while we were there, you know, of course, they were bringing out the wine and pastry and stuff. And uh, one, one uh, civilian, talk, I, I spoke a little bit of Italian, see, I could understand Italian. And uh, he, said, uh, he said, come on upstairs to my apartment. He lived up in a block there. And me and this other fellow went upstairs there, see. So he was an archeologist. And he was showing us the coins that he had found in his tr in his work, see, and they were bunches of uh, like uh, uh, mm. bunches of pieces of, uh, of mud that was frozen together, see. And he said, "See this?" And then he showed us the final product. And my fellow, my friend from New Jersey, uh, he offered he offered us some of his coins, gold coins, see. And I I, I wasn't that type of guy to take advantage of anybody. And I felt that this guy w was going too. He was so happy that we re we relieved him, uh, and uh, he, he wanted to return something for 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 being a liberator. I w I was a liberator, understand? And he he wanted to return the favor, so he offered us something, and my friend took it, and I didn't take nothing. You know, I I, I was an honest guy. And, and <laughs> How long were you in Rome? Oh, uh, we were there. Uh, about a day or so, and then we, we, the war had to go on. As soon as we got on the outside of Rome, the fighting started again. Where was your mission after Rome? Where were you headed? We were headed, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so long ago, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, like I say, we, we were, there was a, I, I think, we, we, yeah, we were firing, we, we were going to, uh, like the, the book there, uh, uh, we, we, were, we were going to, uh, out of the mountains and we went into, uh, the, towards the plains, you know, where it was plains, uh, like out west, you know, it's miles out plains, but the, the, around it is mountains, see? So, we were going. We were supposed to go to relieve this this uh, division online, and we walked to within about eight miles of that where we were supposed to because we could walk eight miles in about three hours, two three hours, and if we walked on back where they were, we would be under observation by the mountains from the Germans. They could see us, and they could bomb. They could, they could, they could kill us. See, so we had to stay about eight miles away, behind the line. And then, and as it as it got darker, about eight o'clock at night it was about this, about this, this time of the year, July, August. Uh, we would uh, we would walk that eight eight miles to the front line. It wouldn't be no problem for us. So, but about four o'clock in the afternoon, we were on line, and all these all our men. And don't forget, you had to be stretched out all the way down, all the way down. I, I, we, I knew that we were gonna, we were gonna uh, stay there until about nine o'clock that night. So I was kind of restless. I said, I'm gonna take a walk. So I, I, took, I was taking a walk down this way, and, and I, I could see a bunch of soldiers that I didn't recognize. Being that I was in S2 section, I was, I was always assigned to a, a, a lead company. And I knew a lot of the guys, all the other companies, because I was in, in between them. I was giving them support. 
but I didn't recognize nobody down here. So I went up to one of the fellows and I said, hey, what company are you? He says, A Company. A Company? That's 1st Battalion. I was 2nd Battalion. He said, yeah, the A Company. I said, do you know Jerry Salvio? He said, yeah, why? I said, he's a good friend of mine from my hometown. I was in the, we were in a bunch of good times together. He said, see that, see that tree over there? It's about 15 feet away or so. See that guy standing against that tree there? That's Jerry. No, yeah, go. I went over there. I, Hey, Jerry, and he, I hugged him, and we were friends. He, we got drafted together, and I didn't see him since we left Camp Gruber. We, we had basic training together, and I didn't see him since Camp Gruber. And he said, Joe, I got good news. I said, what's that, Jerry? He said, I'm going home. I said, how are you going home? In rotation. He said, they started this rotation system. He said, I'm one of the eight guys surviving left. Out of 250 guys, I'm one of eight left. And it, it, they're going to send me home on 30 days, and I'm coming back here. But I'm going home first for 30 days. I said, don't forget when you go home. Now see my folks down Belden Street. It don't, Joe, don't worry. I'll go. I'll see you. I'll see you folks and tell them you're all right. And, you know, we, we, were, we were talking for a little while, and I hugged him, and then I left. And a couple of days later, in my outfit in, in, in Italy, there was about 200 guys from New Britain, in my hometown, wow. that were scattered all over. So a couple of days later, we're, we're, we're walking through the wooded area. I see Johnny Burns. Johnny Burns was the with A Company with, with Jerry. I said, Johnny, how you doing? He said, not good, not good. I said, what's wrong? He said, I'm, I'm a GRO now. You know, GRO, Grave Register's office. He, he's out there to pick the bodies up. I said, how's my friend Jerry? I picked his body up this morning. Oh. I said, no. He said, yeah. I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't put it in my hand. To believe my, I was just talking to him two nights ago. Uh, I couldn't believe it. So when, the, when, when we came off the line, off of that, I went down to A Company. I knew if I, I found out where A Company was. I went to talk to the sergeant. He said, yeah, he said, you know what happened? He says, Jerry and, and all his platoon went into a, a wooded area, uh, uh, olive groves. And when the Germans found them in this olive grove, they shelled with artillery shell. And when, when, the, when the artillery shells burst through all these wooden things, made more shrapnel, these fellas didn't have a chance. They didn't have a chance, he said. They, 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 they threw artillery in there and they busted the trees and everything. And these fellas didn't have a chance. He said, we lost a lot of men in there. And I said, now what am I going to do when I get home? Am I going to tell his mother? I didn't, his mother was living. I, I, I was scared to go up to his mother's house. She'll say, why didn't Jerry come home with you? <laughs> you know, I'm, yeah, I, I'm with PTS. You know what PTS? No. Yeah. Post-traumatic stress. You see it? Could you see it? In you? Yeah. No, I've interviewed several soldiers that have post-traumatic stress, um, and after hearing of all the stories, you can see how much they've lost. I mean, up to this point, you've already seen so much combat uh, and death and destruction. It's unbelievable. It's, it's a wonder that the soldiers could keep on functioning and keep on doing their job in the field. Where did you go from there? Let's go well, to yeah, we, I went to Mount Capello, 
That's where I, Mount Capello. Mount Capello. I, 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 got, I got wounded twice there. Yeah. You want to tell me how that happened? Yeah, it, it's in the, it, you, don't, you don't have a chance to read my notes, huh? No, but if you'll let me borrow them, I'll make copies of it so I can send it into the Library of Congress. Yeah. At this point, we should probably note that um, Joseph brought his brand new book that's out um, about the Battle of Monte Cassino, and there are several pages in there that with Joseph's name in it and the role that he played in that battle. Do you remember the author of the book? Yeah, Matthew Parker. Okay, so that's noted uh, for the record. Uh, and that's just out now, 2004. So, um, how were you wounded at Mount Capello? What were you doing there? You seem to get yourself in the thick of the battle wherever you go. Well, that's that's my that was my job. I would have chose Cook or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I got wounded, I went back. And I went back to the hospital to get operated on. I wanted to go back to my my friends. I wanted to go back. And that's what a lot of soldiers do say too. <laughs> so what happened at Mont? All right, what were you doing at Mont Capello? Did the Germans hold that? Yeah, they, uh, too bad. Uh, they, they, my notes are there. You, you, the, the Battle of Monte Capello uh, Capello is, is short. If you want to read them now, you can't read them now, huh? No, but I'll read them later, and I'll, if you don't mind, I'll make a copy yeah. and send in. But anyway, Mount Capello, uh, we were on the move and everything. <laughs> uh, the uh, on the way it was rainy weather, whole week rain. We were uh, getting the. The Germans were, they were really uh, holding us in Italy. They were, they, they, they we didn't want to lose their foothold in Italy, you know. And uh, so we were climbing the mountain. It was like a, like a, a, a maybe 10 foot trail leading up to the top of the mountain there. And it was covered with small growth and stuff. But there was enough room for us to, to walk up. And we were walking up this thing and it was rainy and it was about six, seven o'clock in the morning and it was foggy. And as we were walking up the mountain, it was fog, see? We were walking up to the mountain, it was foggy. And as, as we got towards the top of the mountain, the fog lifted, the fog lifted <laughs> as soon as the fog lifted, <laughs> there was a machine gunner up there waiting for us. <laughs> oh, we had to scatter down. We had to scatter down. And I, we were, I was kind of scattered down. And as we were scattered, coming down the mountain, the, the fog came down on us again. We couldn't see too much in front of us. As we kept going, coming down the mountain, we saw somebody moving towards us. We saw it. <laughs> we got from here to, to that, that thing there. <laughs> it's Jerry's! It was Germans. There oh. were 14, 15 of them. We were walking right into them. Walking into them. <laughs> they scattered. We scattered. They started to fire. My colonel guy, my, another colonel, another one. Got got hit in the neck, and I, I landed on the ground. And uh, my pack got caught in the, the that scrubby bush. I couldn't I couldn't get myself out of that pack. So I I had unbuckle unbuckle the thing so it releases everything. It releases. Everything. I left the thing, and I took my rifle and I ran down the hill. You know? <laughs> and everybody scattered. <laughs> and and about about an hour later. <laughs> These these Germans knew that they were in the wrong land. <laughs> wrong land. They they came. In, they were recruits. They, they they were replacements. And they came in at night. And they were lost in the fog. And they were now they were trying to go back to their own side of the of the of the mountain. 
So they were probably just as confused. Yeah, they yeah. were probably so shocked to be running into Americans. <laughs> oh, were you wounded at that time? No, no. <laughs> so we captured them. There was 20 of them. So they gave up. They gave up because they knew they were outnumbered. They were on our land, understand? Yeah. They were smart. You know, guess what? <laughs> So they, they take all the information off these 20 guys now. Take all the information off. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Mandero, take this down to, this, uh, to the rear CP, all this information. <laughs> now they wanted me to go to this virgin land n nobody ever went through, m maybe loaded with uh, German snipers with all this information and, and bring it down to the rear CP. Walk the, through the wooded areas. Understand? <laughs> so I said, look it, I can't go down alone. What, what if I, uh, they catch me <laughs> with all this information? They'll string me up. <laughs> so, so they said, all right, take another man with you. <laughs> we went and we were crawling down the mountain <laughs> with all this information, you know, <laughs> bringing it to the back. And as we went, we, f we found the, the other thing. This is all fluid. It, 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 this is just moving. It, it's not stationary. It, the war is moving all the time. The, if the OP is here right now, uh, t not a half hour or so, it's someplace else. <laughs> So did you make it back to the sea? Yeah, we, I made it. Made, no, it was raining. So as we went, we were, we were checking out these homes, houses that were in the, in, in the, our way, Conte. So it was raining like hell. We were soaking wet. We knock on this uh, uh, door. It's by the 8 o'clock now in the morning. And this Italian is coming to the door. Tedeschi. Tedeschi means German. No, Americano. See, si, Americano, see, si, see, si, Americano, you Americano. Italian, per, parla Italiano, see, si, parla Italiano. They asked if I was parla Italiano. They, they, I said, I said they, they didn't believe that we were Americans because the Germans were just there a little while ago. They said, how, how could you be Americans when we were Germans? We were just talking to them not too long ago. <laughs> but that's war. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, they, they said, we were going to go, they said, they said, no, 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 they took our, they had a fireplace going, they took our, our coat, our jacket, and put it by the fireplace, and they were making some kind of breakfast there, you know, <laughs> so they gave us the breakfast, yeah. <laughs> it probably helped, Joe, that you spoke Italian. <laughs> and after you got fed and warm, you were on your way? Yeah, down to that, we... And we, we brought this thing, and, and as we was approaching the thing, and they, and I see one of the, the, the captain who was, who was crawling around. I said, what's wrong, captain? Why are you crawling around? Is there, there's a sniper around here. Watch it. There's a sniper around here. <laughs> After you delivered the stuff to the CP, did you have to go back to your unit then? Yeah. The same way you just found <laughs> So anyway, on Mount Capello, uh, our troops, G Company, was trying to take this mountain. And they got about three quarters of the way up there. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and the Germans surrounded them. And they, they, they threw, they threw uh, fire, machine gun, uh, mortar fire, and artillery fire behind them. So their only alternative is, is to go forward because there was no f firing in front of them. So they were going forward. As they were going forward, there was Germans there to capture them or, or shoot at them. So a lot of them were sh shot, wounded. And they were left there on the ground, daytime, see? And they're hollering, medic, medic, all hollering for medic, see? So it started to get dark. And the, 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 there was a new battalion commander now. They, you know, we lost a lot of battalion commanders. Huh? You know why? Because they had their helmet, their, their insignia on the helmets, and, and these guys are looking through some things there. So they killed the guy that's got the most power. You understand? So we lost. We lost a lot of a lot of battalion commanders. So the order was to go up there and retrieve the wounded men. Now the Germans wouldn't let you go up there, understand? 
So, so I, I was with the group that, that had to go up there to relieve him, see, at about two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> uh, that they're, they're hollering, medic! Now that they're all exhausted, you know, from yelling all day long, and they're they're tired and they're, they're wounded, and uh, and, the, and the lieutenant says, "Okay, you, you and you go up about a, about three four hundred feet, and and establish a listening post so in case they try to uh, counterattack." He says, "You'll you come down and warn us." So I mean. <laughs> I mean, this guy had to go, go up way on top there. So we were there about a half hour. And they might, the Germans might have seen us as we came up there. We were, sometimes there's a moon out, and they were outlined, you know. They could see this, us going up there. About a half hour when we were up there, they threw a hand grenade. <laughs> I got hit right under the eye. This piece is still there. Oh my heavens! Yeah, and I was bleeding profusely. I was bleeding like hell. And so me and this other guy, he was wounded war more than I was. And we we said, let's get down. We we'll warn them. So we went down to the hill to to warn our men. See, but they knew that there was something going on because they, they know. heard the the bomb, the, the, the grenade go off. You know? <laughs> and uh, so. But, I, I was trying to wipe myself, clean myself off and everything, and uh, when, when day broke, broke and they saw me, I, I was ble I was all blood all over everything. He said, hey, Joe, you better go down and look, check that out. He says, you, you're, your uniform's all blood and everything. Go down, I had to, so I had to go down, get down the mountain, go down on the way down. Hey, Joe, oh, good luck to you, Joe. You're going back. <laughs> For the, the, I had a, what they call a million dollar wound. <laughs> I had a million dollar wound. Oh, you're lucky, Joe. You're going to go back for a rest. <laughs> and they were on, on the bottom of the hill in reserve, some of these guys, you understand? <laughs> so what happened? You went to the so, hospital. Yeah. Obviously, we both know you didn't get to go home. No, no. I go down. I, I had to find. Like I say, this this is a fluid situation. The the, the the medic station is not stationary. He's moving around like anybody else. Understand? So I'm looking around for the for the medic. See? So I, I find the medic. I, I said, he, he looks at me. He says, well, let me wipe it off. He takes some alcohol, wa washes it off. He says, okay, go back up. He sent you right back up. Yeah, there? I went up back up a hill. So. I went back up the hill, and when I went back up the hill, the, uh, the, the, the guys that I passed going down, hey, what, what are you coming back for? <laughs> so I, I goes back up there, and guess what? They, the medics, they got a couple of sticks. It's a white. I don't know where they got the white from, the handkerchiefs or what, and they put it in the air like that, and they went and they retrieved all the wounded guys in daylight. It was about 10 o'clock in the morning. They, they retrieved all these, wooden, all these wounded guys, took them off the hill, and not a, not a uh, shot was fired by the Germans. Not a shot was fired. So I got that down in there. They, 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 they took the Germans off. So. They took, I watched this, I never saw that before. So they took all these, these um, Americans off that were wounded down, see. So I was up there, it was about 10, 11 o'clock, and uh, somebody says, hey, Joe, your sergeant's down the bottom of the hill, he says for you to come down. So I, I goes down, I says, hey, hey what's, what's wrong? He says, Could, Joe, I understand you got wounded. I said, yeah, he said, well, take a little rest. So. I was taking my jacket off. I was taking my jacket off, and guess what? Don't tell me you got wounded again. Yeah, I did. mortar fire. You know, mortar fire. They go shh, shh, boom, right on my back. That's why I hollered to the guy next to me. Did I get hit? Yeah, yeah. You better go to the medic. 
At this time, I knew where the medic was. He, he took <laughs> he, I went to the medic, and he, 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 I see him writing a tag out. And I know I'm going this time. So he, they took me and a bunch of other guys to, to the back of a, a, a place where there was an ambulance. And that, there was an ambulance there. And he was driving us guys about four or five miles to, a, to, a, to, a, to an area where there was an open field and there was a C-47 plane. And we flew back from that point to Rome. I went to Rome. I went to Rome and they took off the, the trap. I had a piece of my cheek here and I had, you see that, there's the, see, uh -huh. this piece there. I still got this in here. And the, 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 the VA, uh, they wanted to do an MRI on me a couple of years ago. And uh, the, the woman radiologist down in West Haven, she's a Mr. Mandero. Yes. She says, uh, I understand you need an MRI. Well, they tell me in New England I do. He says, well, uh, I'm chief uh, radiologist at West Haven. I got to ask you a couple of questions. I right, go to ask. Do you have any metal in your head? Yes. You do? I said, yes. How come? I got a piece of hand grenade under my eye, lodged under my eye. How do you know that? I was there at, at the, at the, at the, at the, at the, at the, at the uh, plastic surgery, and he took an x-ray of it, and he found it, and there's a piece under my eye. And I asked him, why can't he take it out? And he said, no, it's too close to something else, and it's too dangerous to take out. I said, I said, uh, uh, Mark that down so that I can get compensation for it. I said, this is deteriorating my life because I, now I need an MRI and I can't get it. I, I'm not getting nothing for it. They wouldn't... I, I, my, I, I have trouble with my eyes. And I'm not supposed to be doing any driving. So he asked the, the DAV for rides. You know, they said, you have to be 30% disabled. Well, so what am I gonna do? How am I gonna get here? I have trouble getting a ride. They, they brought me here. Right. Uh, well, after you recovered from the mortar wound in your back, you still didn't get to go home? No. That's, I, I was in Rome at the hospital after, after I was convalescent there. <laughs> I, I, was, I was at a, at a mess hall downstairs where ambulatory people were able to walk down to eat. It's about ten, about, about, about ten, about ten, uh, ten tables further over from where I was eating, you know. This guy's looking at me, I'm looking at him, he's looking at me, I'm looking at him. So he's waiting for me, I'm waiting for him. Every, all the people leave, see. And when they leave, I'm rushed, I'm looking, I'm going towards him, he's coming towards me. Pucci! Mendero! <laughs> Another new Britain. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's pretty amazing that all your buddies from New Britain that you run into in Italy. And you know what, I was at the VA the other day, guess who I saw there? Oh. This guy I met in Rome. You're kidding. 60 years later. Oh, my heavens. Pucci, Ray Pucci. Isn't that funny? He Come keeps coming it. back. Yeah, I meet a lot of my friends. Uh, uh. After you got out of the hospital in Rome, where did you go? <laughs> you know what they said to me? What? If you want to visit Rome for a couple of days. Every day you stand guard outside the hospital here, you get a day off to go to Rome. So I did that for about a week or so. And guess what? Well, I'm a Catholic. Don't tell me, you went to the Vatican and saw the Pope. I kissed his ring. Pope Pius XII. I see a bunch of uh, English 
soldiers going into the Vatican. So I asked them, what's going on? They said, uh, the, the Pope was to do out, they're going to give us his blessings. It's come into the chapel there. I went into the chapel there, and the Pope's sitting there on his throne, and there's a Swiss guard here, and a Swiss guard there, a colorful uniform. And the Pope comes out there, and he's giving us his blessings. And, his, and then after his blessings, we all file past him, and he extends his left ring out. We kiss it, and, and, and the Swiss guard wipes it. <laughs> and you know what? That was October 1944, and that was my key to come home, my blessings to come home, my ticket to come home. Why, did you leave shortly after that? No, no, but that, I came home. You came home. And you did you see came. what all I went through? Yeah. I came home. That's no small miracle, if you ask me. Well, like I say, I came home. And I, I, I said it was on the. I went to Pope Pius the Twelfth. He was the tall, tall pope. After your, so where'd you go back to? <laughs> then after that, we went to. We had, it was stationary winter at Bolzano. We, it was winter came and we we uh, we stopped. The static line. And from there, where'd you go? Well, like I could say, we uh, we weren't there on the on the line there. We didn't, nobody moved. The Germans were, didn't move. We didn't move. In fact, uh, I was on the line at Christmas Eve in an OP observation post on the ground. Understand? And uh, about about eleven o'clock, me and another fellow. We're always two. There's always two men there. Uh, we heard his Christmas carols. I, on, the, on the line, I was singing, see. So I ring the phone. Uh, this is a, the CP. CP is the command post. This is CP. I, well, this is OP1. Uh, what's wrong, OP1? Well, we hear a bunch of carols being sung out there in front of us. What is your azimuth? You know what azimuth is? Is a direction on the compass. Well, I gave him, it's five degrees. Uh, how, how do you estimate the range? About 500 yards. <laughs> 30 minutes later, <laughs> they sent over artillery shells. <laughs> Was the Germans singing Christmas carols? Or the yeah, Americans? The, yeah, the, the Germans were singing Christmas carols, and and I didn't I didn't want them to to to, to send no uh, artillery shells or to kill the guys. <laughs> so ha, ha, half hour later, uh, the, the, our phone rings. LP one, yes, this is CP one. Uh, is there any more Christmas carols out there? <laughs> <laughs> and do you know what? Christmas, at New Year's Eve, the Germans shot tracer bullets in the air. The whole, the whole sky, tracer bullets, 12 o'clock at night, for tracer bullets. Do they have a sense of celebration? Yeah, yeah, they did. <laughs> After your winter rest online, where'd you go? <laughs> I, uh, we started to uh, uh, get pre prepared to, to for the final attack at the, at the, uh, at Bolzano and uh, Bologna, Bologna. Uh, I think it was Bologna, yeah. And uh, did you attack Bologna? Well, we we we. Uh, uh, the Germans w w were now on more or less uh, were, uh, not as active as they were originally because now the time is, was was getting closer to, towards the end of the war. But we didn't know that it was that close to the end of the war. In fact, we didn't even know the war was was war was over until they, they told us. They said we're, we're we're at this mountain at the bottom foot of the mountains. Well, are we into 1945 now. It, yeah, right in the 45, yeah. 
So did you attack Bologna before the war ended or no? Well, we, we, yeah, we, we, uh, let's see. We, we were continually uh, moving, you know, uh, and uh, we got to this mountain in the, near the foot of the hills of the Alps, and uh, we wanted to know why why we were stalled there. You know, it was good weather and everything, and these we thought maybe we had, being that we were close to the Alps, so we were going to get get into the Alps. And they, they were going to give us heavier clothing, maybe because it was going to be colder at a higher altitude, you know. So we were there a couple of days, two, three days. And uh, all of a sudden, the, the lieutenant, the company commander, he gets all of us together, he gets the whole company together. He says, okay, friend, fellas, I got news for you. Don't raise your hopes up, but we got word they're talking peace in Naples. Wow! The screen going on and everything, you know. But don't get your hopes up. They're just talking, you know. And uh, we were told to hold what we have, not to advance, just to stay where we are until more further news comes. The chaplain is going to say a mass at five o'clock in the local church, and everybody went heathens and Jews, Christians, and everybody was at that service, <laughs> praying that this was true. That it was a small church in a small town, and they all went to this church. <laughs> How much later did you hear about that? Then, the war was over. Then the next day, they they uh, they told us that it was definite that there were co continuing talks, and we were not supposed to to uh, advance. And the Germans sent word to us. I don't know how they do it, but they sent word to us that w we we were told not to to have any any fight between us, that there is some talk going on, but nothing's definite. And we didn't know what to do. So a couple of days goes by, and now they said the war is over. Where were you when you heard the news the war was over? Well, I, I was in this town, I forget the name of the town, uh, Borgo, I think, Borgo. I think it was Borgo, Italy. And, and, and everybody was happy, and uh, now they says, the Germans sent us a word, don't advance. We will kill anybody advancing towards us. So we sent the word to them. We'll give you an ultimatum at 12 o'clock tomorrow night. If you're not laying down your arms by that time, we're coming in with, 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 with uh, 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 power. You know, we're going to, we're going to resume the war, understand? So we didn't hear nothing from them. So it was 11.30 that night, the trucks coming in, all the trucks that were coming in, loading, we were loading up all in these trucks in advance, and now we maybe have to go two, three miles into their lane to take over the position. The trucks are all lined up, and you know, <laughs> You're not old enough, but all of the lights, all of the headlights on the cars in the United States had tape over them. Did you know that? They had cat's eyes. Did you know that? No. For the war? No. no during the war. Any, Why were they taped? Because they didn't want the, the, the lights to, to, to show, show up. So yeah. they, it was for war could, Yeah, because in case the airplane started to come attack here, the lights would, would give them places where they could fire at, understand? Yeah. So, so especially car lights, understand? So they, all your headlights and stuff were taped, and they had just had cat's eyes. So they had 
way to see without getting into an accident, see? And we used to have them on our trucks out there because we, they didn't uh, uh, use the trucks at night because on account of uh, uh, the, uh, the lights would, would illuminate the place, see? So, they took all the tape off. The lights were shining bright, you know, and we're, and we're with our rifles on, I think, and we're sitting in the, in, in the truck, back of the truck, you know, there's about, about 10, 15 guys in the, each truck on each side, see, and not a word. Everybody was in fear, waiting for the, waiting for the artillery shell to come in and, and bust our truck up. And, uh, and towards, his, towards his, the enemy's position, see. When we goes all the way up into the thing. We get into the thing, and not a, fire, not a shot was fired, and they accepted it. And we come in there, and it was about 12 o'clock at night now, and we get into this building, the old building, and this German soldier sleeping in here, and sitting there, and all over, they were sleeping all over. <laughs> and we were Americans, the, the night before that, we were enemies. And, and that, that they were talking back and forth, fraternizing, you know. <laughs> it wasn't that bizarre feeling. It must have felt strange. And the next morning we woke up and we, we, we saw the young kids. They were soldiers, 16 years old. This was, <laughs> God bless you, toward, towards the end of the war, they, they were using kids. So I told this kid, a friend of mine from New Jersey, the one that took the gold I told you, I said, Rudy, <laughs> God bless you. I, uh, I said, Rudy, do you see that house up on the hill there? We're gonna go up there and bring our cave rations. You know what cave rations are? Uh -huh. We'll bring our cave rations, and we'll, we'll try to get some eggs for it, see? So he goes up to this house up on the hill, and we knock on the door, it's about seven o'clock in the morning. We knock on the door, and, and a lady about 80, 85 years old comes to the door, scared like hell. I said, Nente paura, nente paura, senora. She said, Tedeschi, Tedeschi, she call her Germans. I said, Nente Tedeschi, Americano. Oh, no, no. She says, Tedeschi. They were there the, the same afternoon. I said, No, I said, like, where the fenute? I said, the war is over. She wouldn't believe me. She says, why does an American, they thought the Americans were princes and kings and stuff, why would a princess or a prince come down to visit my humble home? Why would an American, she thought the Americans were, you know, everything. Nothing but the best, you know, and coming into her house looking for eggs. <laughs> she wouldn't believe it. She wouldn't believe it. She wouldn't believe it. And, and I said, I, I convinced her that we were Americans, and I said, could, could we have some eggs? We'll give you this American food in exchange. She said, yes, but I have hiding places for all that stuff. Because if I didn't have hiding places, the Germans would take it. They, she had hiding places for her chickens, hiding places for her eggs and stuff like that. They would hide everything. Otherwise, they would have nothing to eat. She was way on top of the mountain, like in the Ozark Mountains. You know like the Ozark Mountains? They're destitute and way up in the mountain. She, that was about the same thing with her. She was way up there. And, and, she, and uh, she gave us the thing. You know, one thing she, she, she said that, she, 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 she said, I'm a very old woman. She says, there's one thing I, I like to see before I die. Um, how much longer were you in Italy before you shipped home? I, am, I went to Germany after. You went to Germany? Yeah. I, 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 I took the prisoners back from Italy on freight, uh, freight cars. To take the prisoners back yeah, to Germany? Yeah, yep. Holy uh, man, well. In, in July of 1945. It was three days up because there was only one track working because it was May, the war ended, and this is July. So they didn't have a chance to, to, to repair all the tracks. 
they just repaired one. So we, they repaired one, and they had these freight cars going every day to Munich, Germany. And we, anybody that, like me wanted to volunteer to see another country, you had the chance to see another country by volunteer as a guard, as a guard escort going to bring these German prisoners back to, to, to Germany. Did you go right into Munich? Yeah, we went to Munich. And you delivered the prisoners? Yeah, we, 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 yeah, we had a freight car of 40 cars now. Look, listen to this. 40 cars. Each car had 40 prisoners in it and one American guard. And no contact between us. No contact between the guards, n nothing. And guess what? When we first got into the cars, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, there was always a one out of the 40 prisoners, there's always one that can speak English. And guess what he asked me? Do you have a cigarette? Uh, comrade, do you sell them cigarette? <laughs> Did you have a cigarette? I, I had six packs because I was a frontline soldier, and every day we were rationed a pack of cigarettes. So they gave us six packs, three to go up and three to come back. So I had six packs of cigarettes with me, and this guy wanted to buy cigarettes off me. And, and you know what? <laughs> I don't know if I should say it or not, but they had the American Japanese in Italy as a soldier like I was. Yep. 442nd, the regiment. And before we took over their camp, the PW camp, prisoner of war camp, uh -huh. they were in charge of this camp. And when, when they were selling cigarettes, and I don't know, this is a rumor, when they were selling cigarettes to the, to the, to to the, the Germans, Germans, they were selling for $20 a pack. A rip-off, huh? What'd you sell them to us for? <laughs> you don't have to tell me you don't want to. No, no you know what? <laughs> I was in the, like I said, there was no communication between the cars, and we were going through tunnels four and five miles long, dark, Right. and we were going over bridges 60 feet in the air, made out of, you know what rector sets are? Yes. We had to go five miles an hour over these rector sets. <laughs> and I, I got scared. I said, if I don't play ball with these guys, they're going to tr throw me out the door, accident. Right. So it was about four or five hours later, he kept pestering me. I said, you want to buy cigarettes? He, yes. I'll sell you three packs. I got three packs. I, sm I was smoking that time, see. Uh, I'll sell you three packs. And, you know, there was a non-fraternization ban. You couldn't fraternize with these guys, never mind talking to them. <laughs> and if you're doing business with them, you're in trouble, see? So I, I didn't want to, I would have gave them the cigarette, but they're enemies. Why should I give them something? Understand? And they're gonna take it away from me, so <laughs> I might as well get something in return for it, right? Okay. So I said, in the camp, you were bu buying cigarettes for a $20 pack. I want $20 pack. Oh, no! We don't pay no twenty dollar pack. I said, well, you don't get no cigarettes. <laughs> so, so like I say, it started to get darker, and I was getting more scared. See, and so I, I says, here, I took my steel helmet off. I had my steel helmet. Here, I put three packs in there. I passed, uh, pass it around. Put it whatever you want in, into the thing. I'll take whatever you want. He passed it around. It was $54 for three packs. So you just about got yeah. your $20 yeah. pack. Yeah, but I wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't there for the money right. I, I, because they were prisoners. Right. Uh, understand? How do I know they didn't kill my friend? Exactly. Uh, we're running out of time, so I'm going to jump on to, all right, how did you finally get home? <laughs> I came home on the West Point boat. And did you leave from Germany or Italy? Italy. I, I, there's another story involved, too. I had cousins out there, and uncles in Italy, and I tried to locate them. Uh, and what happened was they were living in an area 
that was being was occupied by the Germans, and I was about 35 miles close to them, and uh, I, I contacted this uh, maybe a, a, a distant relative of mine, because my father and mother, when they found out I was in Italy, they they uh, they gave me this address and this cousin to to, to locate to see if he, they could, he could help me. See, so I located him, and I visited with him. And he said, Joe, in Italian, he said, Joe, I can't help you. I said, why not? He said, your, your, your uncle's in where the Germans are there now. There's the front lines are there. You can't go there. The, the bus don't run there. He says, come back when the lines are moved, and then you and I will take a bus when the bus is running, and I'll take it. I'll write where, where your uncle is. I said, okay. When I went back to my lines, I had to stay there because the lines didn't move. So two, three months, and then we moved. And when we started to move, we started to move. And we never were getting farther away, you see. So when the war ended, it ended way up. I was up in, up in Verona, way up in northern Italy. And so now we were coming back home uh, uh, by, by the freight cars. We were sitting in, uh, laying in the freight car, no seats, no nothing. Just straw, a little bit of straw. We were coming back, back down to Naples to get on the bo boat to come home. But the war in Japan was still going on. We were supposed to go home for 30 days and then go to Japan. They didn't, they, they were, so, so I went to see the, this guy, this guy that, that I met before, see? He said, Joe, thank God you're alive. We worried about you. I saw your uncle in the meantime. He, 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 he was happy you were over here. I can't understand why you didn't come down to see him and this and that. He, he said, well, come on, tomorrow morning, you, you, you come here first thing in the morning and I'll take it you to your uncle. I said, Joe, I haven't been home in two years. If they tell me I got to go on a boat tomorrow morning, I'm going on the boat. I'm going home first. <laughs> so I, I goes back to camp. <laughs> my sailing list is on the board. My name is on the board. So I didn't go to see. I never. I missed all a year and a half. That was one of the heartbreaks of the war for me. That I didn't see my uncle. Yeah, there's a you know. The Hollywood story, there's always a good end, ending to it. In my case, there wasn't. Yeah. Where did you land when you got back to the United States? I landed in Fort Devens, up in Massachusetts, Boston. Do you remember your last day in service? Yeah, I, I, I got my, uh, down, I had to go to, to uh, uh, Fort Bragg down in North Carolina. Is that where you were discharged? Yeah, yep. Yeah. What did you do after the war? I uh, was in the house wrecking business. What? <laughs> house wrecking business. House wrecking? Yeah. <laughs> and you came back to New Britain, Connecticut? Right. And you stayed here all these years? Yeah, I got married here, got three kids. Uh, when did you get married? August, I mean, the September 15th, 1945. And you have three children? Yeah. How many girls, how many boys? Two girls and one boy. Did you stay in touch with any of your army buddies? Yeah, I met them at reunions. I went to a reunion in San Antonio, Texas, Atlanta, Georgia, Baltimore, uh, Boston, Mass, Hartford, Washington. I went to the reunions. Do you still attend any reunions? No, no. Uh, too old. I uh, <laughs> got to use a cane and stuff. Uh, well, you're still in pretty good shape, let me tell you. Uh, you, you. How old am I? Well, you told me you were born in 1920, so yeah. that makes you 84. Right. So I know. <laughs> Did you join any veterans organizations? I've blocked, I've blocked all of them. Huh? I've blocked all of them. Can you remember all the names? Yeah, VFW, American Legion, DAV, uh, Elks. 
TGM, you know TGM? No. That's the, uh, that's the TGM, uh, it's the Northwestern Veterans Organization, Northwestern Veterans Organization. How did your military experience affect your life? <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't sell my experiences for a million dollars. No. Even ten million dollars, no. I, I didn't. I, I didn't come out monetarily, but uh, uh, I made a lot of friends, and uh, I've seen a lot. You know, I, I went to, like, say Germany, North Africa, Italy. Uh, I would never have gone if I wasn't in the service. And uh, I've been treated right. I mean, the, the VA treated, treats me. Uh, the only thing I resent, I'm a, a World War II veteran, was wounded twice, and uh, I still have to pay for my medication. I, I don't think that's fair. I've been paying for my medication. And sometimes it's $160 a month. and uh, and. Uh, I don't think that's fair. I mean, did your military experience influence the way you think about war or about the military in general? Well, there has to be there has to be an army to protect the innocent and. Uh, I think that uh, they should renew the draft because uh, the experience I had, I met a lot of fellows that were drafted, they were good soldiers, real good soldiers. And uh, just because you're being drafted, that doesn't mean that you're going to lay down your, your pistol or a rifle or whatever. you're going to do your job because like I say, you're part of America. America is a the best, as far as I could see, is the best country in the world, you know. And, and, and in order to get the best men to fight for for your country, and I think you have to draft them because you meet all kinds of good good people. I had the experience that I say you you, you meet a lot of a lot of good. A lot of good people. Well, Joseph, I would like to thank you very yeah. much for sharing your yeah. story, and I'd like to thank you for the service that you've done for our country. Thank you for coming here today. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'm, I'm privileged to be honored to, to be accepted into your program because I, I think that the word has to be out there that. There's a lot of sacrifices being made by, by men that were drafted like I was, understand? I was drafted. I, would, I didn't volunteer. It's, that's on my record. And I tried to make the best of it. You know, I came back. And like I say, I met famous people like I met the Pope, five to 12. And, and I met, at one of my reunions, I met Mark Clark and his wife and his family with my wife. You know, we were at the at at the reunion and they had a uh, a, a, a a what do you call it a thing before the banquet, just to get together social before the banquet, and we, I got to talking with Mark Clark, which is the general of the armed forces in Italy, yeah, with his wife. 